You know, last Saturday on the way home from Phoenix, my wife looked at me and she said, she, I'd missed my turn, and she said, um, hey, Lyndall, what's up? You missed your turn. And, and then she proceeded to ask me some other questions, and, and I was thinking the responses, and I was verbalizing in my mind what to respond, but nothing was coming out of my mouth. And, of course, she says, um, hey, stop joking around. <laughs> and, I was, and I honestly thought to myself, maybe I am joking around. This isn't fun. You probably should say something. But I couldn't speak. Um, turned the car off. She said, look at me, Lyndall. And I looked at her, and the right side of my face was beginning to droop. She said, I think you are either having Bell's palsy or you're having a stroke. So we began an illegal pursuit to Albuquerque at an accelerated rate without me driving. Good news. <laughs> and uh, over the course of several days in the hospital, I came to understand that I had actually experienced a small stroke. Uh, MRI showed some issues back here. But you know, when I was in the hospital, um, and I don't know if you've ever been through something like that, but they do all sorts of tests to see what's up with your brain and what's going on and what, you know, your feet, your hands, all this stuff. But they also did these, these like math quizzes and memory quizzes and stuff, and, and uh, I hated those. You know, it's like, hey, I'm going to tell you five things, and then I'm going to talk for an hour, and then I'm going to ask you what those five things were. So, in order to share that experience, I want us to have a stroke test. Ready? Here we go. I want everyone here, everyone, everyone has to participate because this might save your life. I want you to pick a number between 1 and 10. Anyone, anyone, everyone. Okay, but don't share it. Keep it right here. Don't write it down. That's cheating. I want you to pick a number between 1 and 10. Got it? Come on. Got it? Awesome. Now, we're going to do some math. Ready? I know a lot of us were educated in New Mexico. We ranked 50th. But I have faith in you and faith that that number is going to change. So multiply the number in your head by two. Multiply by two. Got it? Oh, some of you didn't. What was that? Got it? All right. Very good. Now that new number, I want you to add eight to. Okay? Add eight. Got it? Awesome. So we've done multiplication. We've done addition. How about division? I want you to divide that new number by two. Divide it in half. Got it? Got it. Man, y'all are good. So what's less? Uh, subtraction. Okay, now we're going to test your memory. The number in your head right now, I want you to subtract your original number that you chose between one and ten. Do you remember what it was? You got it? Okay, subtract that from it. Got it? Awesome. Now, at this point, you should have a number somewhere between 1 and 26. Am I right? Okay, you got a number between 1 and 26. Okay, now it gets hard because we're going to go away from math and we're going to go into English, my favorite subject. Not really, that's why I married an English teacher. Okay, if your number is 1, it's between 1 and 26, A through Z. You get where I'm going here? If your number's 1, A, 2, B, 3, Okay, do you got it? Okay, so give me a little minute. If you need to take your shoes off, go ahead. You can sing the song. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay, got it? All right. So everyone right now is thinking of a letter, right? Okay, now we're going to go geography. Got it? I want you to think of a country that begins with that letter. Okay, you got it? You got it? A country. Now, we just had the Olympics. Think about the parade of nations. Think about all those flags. Not everyone's got one, I could tell. <laughs> if you need to cheat, now would be a time to cheat. Say, hey, do you know of a nation that starts with Q? <laughs> okay, do you have a nation? You got one? Okay, take the last letter of that nation. So if it were China, it would be A. So whatever your nation is, take the last letter. Got it? Got it? And think of an animal that begins with that letter. Okay, now how many of you are having a stroke right now? 
Okay, for the rest of you, one last question. Does that animal belong in the country that you're thinking? No? What country does it belong in? <laughs> Good day, Grace. And if you've not knocked so much, we'd like to get into some Bible study before we throw some shrimp on the barbie. You know, everyone knows that there are no kangaroos in Denmark. But there are in Australia. Isn't that weird? <laughs> that was great. I'll pay you later for that. All right. You know, I do that to illustrate a very simple lesson that God's been teaching me, and it's this. Rick preached on this a few weeks back and talking about the differences between the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. And one of the things that I love about the God is that he always stacks the deck. Do you know that expression? Stacking the deck. He always gives you, it's like the great magician that says, pick a card, any card. But you know that no matter what card you pick, at the end of this little game, they're going to go, ta-da! Is this your card? And you're going to go, how did they do that? Well, it's a little trick called stacking the deck. And what I am convinced of is that God is an expert in stacking the deck. Not only is he good at giving us everything we need to be successful in following his call. He will even allow the enemy to come into our lives and to try to wreak havoc. He will allow the enemy to come into our lives and to try to do all sorts of things to distract us and persuade us in other directions and all sorts of things. But even those things, he brings back around and he stacks the deck for us to find and fulfill God's purpose for our lives. Over the next 10 weeks, we're going to be diving into Exodus 14. I wanted to get started just a week early with us. And I want you to turn to Exodus 14. I got good news. If you don't know where Exodus is, start at the beginning. You're going to get there quickly. <laughs> Genesis, Exodus. And it's 14 back. If you can't figure out where 14 is, then you need help. So, Exodus 14. There we go. And I want to read you a story that's going to set up this whole idea that we're going to be going through with the Red Sea rules. And the idea is, what do you do when you find yourself between a rock, a mountain, and the sea, a wet place, and you don't know where to go? And you don't really know why you're there, and you're not really sure that God knows where you are, but you've been pretty certain that you've been following God the whole way. It's like the proverbial, why do bad things happen to good people? And I want to read this. I'm going to set the stage, though, if I can. Israelites, remember the story. Now, if you don't know the story, I apologize. I'm going to assume some things that you might know. But good news for you. It's early in the book. It's early in the Bible. You only have Genesis and Exodus. So if you don't know it, go home, read the back story. You only have a book and a half to go. So this one's pretty early in the story of the Bible. And God has delivered the people of Israel from Egypt, right? Remember the plagues? You know, the frogs and the, and the boils and the, all the crazy stuff. The sea turning to blood and all the, woo, you know, Moses. and Oh, I need something. Sorry. Hey, let me, can I borrow your stick? Thanks, I appreciate that. And the God rod, remember that? You know? Moses had, I called it the God rod because, you know, he would, he would like throw it down and it turn into a snake. Okay, I didn't think that was going to work. But um, <laughs> I wanted to try it just once, so you know what I mean? Because if that had just turned to a snake, y'all would have freaked out. <laughs> and my wife especially. And I wouldn't have picked it up. So um, it would have stayed a snake, so we would have had some problems. But God, you know, he had this stick and, and he had Moses and the, leading the people out. And I mean, it's just this glorious story about the power of God. And they head out into the wilderness. They head out of Egypt with all the spoils and they, they start marching. And, and then God's, 
God's so funny. He says, hey, Moses, do a U-turn. Do a little circle. <laughs> and he sends them back to this specific place. Ah, oh, I don't know about you, but I hate U-turns. I hate to cycle back, circle back. So they do, and they go in. I'm going to skip down to verse 10, just because the first couple of verses got a lot of big words. I'm not sure if that part of my brain is still there, so um, I'm just going to skip to the easy ones. Uh, Exodus 14.10, as Pharaoh approached. So we have the scene, right? The people of Israel, they're in this little beached area. The, the mountains here, they would come through this pass, and, and there's the ocean, and there are the mountains, and they're going... I told you he was lost. You know there was someone's mom sitting in the back of the camp going, I told you we were circling. I told you that guy did not know the way. And you know men, men never ask for instructions, never ask for directions, never look at a map. You know there were, don't you? Because you think it. When you're reading, you're like, oh great, Moses leads them into nowhere, into a trap. And the Egyptians are thinking, I knew that boy was slow. <laughs> and then it begins. As Pharaoh approached, who was Pharaoh? Did he have any relationship with Moses? Backstory, huh? Did he? Hmm. Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up. And there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified. And they cried out in a loud voice. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone, Moses. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in this desert. Don't you love the people of God that are just full of faith? Amen. <laughs> you know, they've just seen the plagues. You know, they got their firstborn kids still alive. They have spoils from Egypt. And yet they're still, I mean, let's be honest, they're still like you and I. No matter what God does in our lives, no matter how God provides, no matter what miracle God has done, we get into a hard place and the first thing we do is we start saying, but God, why me? Why here? Why now? And then Moses, I'm going to call him Mo if that's all right, because I just think that's cool. You know, Mo. Because he had the law of Mo going. You know what I'm saying? Law of momentum. He had it. So there's Moses. And you know he's still got the God rod. You know, people are like, whoo, don't mess with him. He'll throw that type of snake. He'll bite you. You know, there are all sorts of rumors at this point. <laughs> Moses comes. Now, he doesn't have the white hair yet. Because that didn't happen in the movie until later. Okay? <laughs> so now he's still like, he's like the president on the front end. You know, he's got like normal hair. He's not like all white and gray and aged. So he comes up, and Moses answers the people, and he says, Do not be afraid. I'm trying my Moses voice. How's this? Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord that he will bring today. The Egyptians that you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Can't you hear him? Can't you hear Moses? Just... Filling the people with hope. Filling the people with, a, with a, a confidence and a trust that Almighty God is going to deliver. Man, I so want to be like Moses. I want to be a man of faith. That believes God can do the impossible. But you know, I got an insight into Moses. As I was reading this passage after going through some personal things in my own life at all share a little bit more with in a minute. And I saw a verse like I've never seen it before. Verse 15. And then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? You know, there seems to be a change of tone between verse 14 and 15. Verse 14, Moses 
is telling the people, look to the heavens. Look to God. It's going to be glorious. Be full of faith. But deep down in here, in the recesses of his mind and in his fear, he's saying something different. We don't have that recorded. All we have is the response of God. But I'm sure it goes something like this. Oh God, please help! <laughs> please. I don't know if I messed up. I don't know if I led them the wrong way. But man, we are in a pickle here. There's no way out. There's no way to retreat. I mean, we're stuck, God. I told you I shouldn't be leading these people. <laughs> you picked the wrong guy. And then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the waters so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all of his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. What do you think Moses was really going through in this scenario? Let's do some psychoanalysis of Moses. How about it? Okay? Let's, let's just psychoanalyze him. You guys, you know the story, right? I'm going to assume. So let's start over here. Okay, Moses, he didn't start here. He started as a baby, right? So tell me something we know about Moses from his early life. Come on, anyone. You can talk. It, it's all right. He was found in a basket. How was he, how did he get in the basket? His mother put him in the basket, save his life, send him down because all the kids were being killed because some king was going to come and was going to do all sorts of weird stuff. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Kind of sounds like something happens later. But um, so what we know about Jesus, or I'm um, sorry, not Jesus, that's later. Um, what we know about Moses, from the very beginning, he was a basket case. Is that pretty, is that, is that good? He's a basket case from the very beginning. Then he goes on. He gets pulled out of the river. What's something else from his little bit after that? Hey, hey, your turn is over, okay? <laughs> we gave you a chance. Okay, this section right here. What's something else? A little bit after that. He was raised in Pharaoh's house. Now, that's pretty cool, you know? It's a good thing he didn't get caught, you know, get found by the lady in the van down by the river. You know, it was a lady down by the river. She just didn't live in the van. So that's cool. They pull him out. They bring him to Pharaoh's house. He gets all the wonderful privilege of the silver spoon. I think this was probably a gold spoon. Pretty nice. Did he know who he was? Were there any other kids? So he's kind of like a stepkid, right? I wonder if that was odd. Oh, you're Pharaoh. You're going to be Pharaoh. And I'm a basket case. Just to be clear. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a basket case because I got a stuttering problem too. So he's a stuttering stepchild with a basket case. Did I get it right so far? Okay, how about you guys? What happens after that? Okay, he's raised in Pharaoh's house and he starts to come to know who he is. Then what happens? He kills, ooh, he's got an anger problem. Anger management. He starts to figure out who he is. He starts to figure out that this basket case stuttering servant of God is called by God for a purpose. And he has a pretty big identity crisis. Who am I? Don't kill people when you're trying to answer that question. Okay? 
Just a little free advice there. Don't commit murder. Kind of worked out for Moses in the end, but it cost him. So, so he kills this guy in a fit of rage because they're beating up against Israelites. And he's, and, but God begins something. And then, then he, he has to run and hide. Where's he go? Where's he go? Look at that Bible scholar. He's like, tell you, I'd show you on a map, buddy. I love you, man. Hey, when I was having a stroke as a result of God calling me to preach, Kelly, I was thinking of you. I was. I was thinking of all the times that you've said, why don't you speak? I just want to tell you that. Um, he goes out to the desert for a while to spend some time figuring out who he is. But he also gets to figure out who Yahweh is. In a pretty powerful way, right? How, what happens? <laughs> You know, God, like, when God speaks to you through, like, burning stuff, that doesn't burn, that's cool. You know, that's like, that's like that, 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 I think that's when the white hair starts, you know, and a little bit. And, uh, but God, he has an encounter with God where not only does he now know who he is, he knows whose he is. And then what happens after that? He goes to work. He goes into Egypt. I don't know if this is accurate, but it's the movie says so. You know, his brothers, the Pharaoh, stepbrother, I don't know if that's right, but I like to think it is. And he begins to lead the people of God. But do you ever really look at Moses a lot and, and wonder, is this guy really this charismatic, powerful man of God that never doubts, that talks to God face to face, that has cool hair that's been highlighted by the Holy Spirit of God? You know, I mean, is that, he's got this wonderful voice. Or is the Moses really, the Moses of the Bible, is he really a stuttering, insecure, murderer with anger management issues that has just kind of come to a point in his life where he realizes that he's going to be defined by who God says he is. Rather than by his self-doubt. Because when I see this verse, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? You know what to do. Do it. I want you to turn to Numbers 12.3. Um, I don't know the page number, but it's only four books. You know, Genesis, Exodus, and isn't that right, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers? There we go. I had to sing the song. Sorry. Um, numbers, it's four books in, and verse 12. And there's this whole story about some people like thinking, arrogant, thinking Moses has got an arrogance problem. You know, they're like, oh, Moses and his holy God rod. You know, he thinks he's all that and a bag of chips. And they're complaining about him and accusing him. And, and God, I love it, God says, hey, guys, come here. <laughs> Let's talk. And God does some cool stuff and reminds them that, no, Moses knows who he is. But more importantly, he knows who I am. And obviously, you two don't. So let me teach you a little lesson. <laughs> and one of them gets leprosy, so that's a pretty good lesson. <laughs> but in the midst of this lesson, this is what it says in Numbers 12.3. And it's in parentheses. You notice that? It's like an aside. It's like just in case you're wondering, is he the arrogant fool you think him is? Is he this guy? Is he this self-confident, holy man of God, you know? Like the Kool-Aid guy. He just breaks through the wall. Like, hey, you know, is that Moses? <laughs> it's not. It says, now Moses was a very humble man. 
more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Wow. Wow. And you know, one of the things that God's been really speaking to me is that humility is not thinking of yourself, thinking less of yourself. Humility is not playing the messages that the enemy has told you your whole life, that you're a basket case, that you're a stepchild of the family, that you're the the stutterer, that you're the angry, that you're the murderer, that you're the... Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. And you think of yourself less because you think more about who God is. I love Beth Moore has a study that she's doing right now called Entrusted. And I watched a clip of it. I just came by it randomly. And she talks about living and leading out of the tension between personal humility and godly confidence. That there's something powerful that happens in the heart of a person whenever they live between the, the tension of personal humility and godly confidence. I know who I am, but more importantly, I know whose I am. And I know that the great I am who called me to build the kingdom of God, that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That he who called me is faithful and he also will do it. And my whole life I have run from a calling that God has placed on my life. I've gotten close and I've gotten closer here and there. But I have run in fear. Because, man, I feel like Moses, not the strong, bold Moses. I feel like the basket case Moses. You know what I'm saying? I was a kid that grew up in the poor family in the trailer park that, you know, we were poor. We didn't know we were poor because everyone we knew was poor. We didn't have anything. And, you know, we weren't going to mount anything. We were in a town in the middle of nowhere. And, you know. And then I had a, a speech impediment. I couldn't say ours. And I spent six years of my life. First grade through sixth grade. I started in kindergarten, Joy Parish. Then I moved to Bixby, Oklahoma. Woohoo! Hicksby, Oklahoma. Yoo! <laughs> Guns and trucks. <laughs> and I went through speech pathology for six years, all the way through, being pulled out of class to go play Sawwee. But I played it with a guy who couldn't say S's, John Offit. So it was actually Thawi. We played Thawi. So we could learn to say S's and R's. And my brother terrorized me. I love him. God bless his soul. But um, he terrorized me. He'd go, hey, I'll give you a quarter if you'll say it. <laughs> hey, come here. Listen to this kid say quarter. You know, sell her door. <laughs> Door. I'd call the bank to try to get my mom. My mom's name's Rita Nolan. I'd say, is Weta there? <laughs> we don't have a Weta here. Is Weta Nolan here? Weta? No, no Weta works here. No Weta! Oh, I-T-A, Weta. Guys, I was a basket case. So let's be honest. And what happens when you grow up like that? You overcompensate. You become arrogant. And you try to perform. And you do all sorts of other stuff. And... <sighs> But, you know, Satan tried to stack the deck so that I would never speak. I hated speaking. Because when I spoke, I got ridiculed. And just as I started to be able to speak and get involved and started following God and got involved in church, one of the pastors of my church tried to sexually assault me. I won't go into the details for you. But it taught me a good lesson. I will never be a pastor. Because they're a bunch of hypocrites. And time and time and time through my story, God has challenged me. A week ago Saturday, 
No, week, I don't even know, Wednesday, two weeks ago when I was in Florida, God spoke to me in a very powerful way. Take me to lunch sometime and I'll tell you the story. We're going to have to eat sushi, but... (laughs) Or you're going to have to cook us lunch, okay? That's all I'm saying, you know? (laughs) I have to eat some of that weird stuff. (laughs) But I'll tell you the whole story. But I can't do it now. But God called me to be obedient to preach the gospel. And then all hell broke loose. Everything I feel like that could go wrong did go wrong, culminating with me driving home to Roswell to be here for our big Sunday event, only to have a stroke and not be able to speak. But you know... Confidence doesn't come from who we are. And obedience to God's call doesn't require really that much of us. Just a mustard of faith. I asked Rick if I could preach today because I needed to stand up and to speak up. If for anything else, just to say, To hell with the devil. And guys, God is going to do something. And it's going to rock our world. As Rick continues to lead us, as he continues to teach us and to mold us into the pastors that God's called us to be, all of our staff, We get the exciting privilege to be able to get over ourselves and to get over our own issues and to say to the people of God, no matter where you find yourself, whether it's between a rock and a wet place or you're on your way to that beach, you're going to get there eventually. And we're not there by accident. We're there by calling. And when God shows up and shows off, it is going to be glorious. So keep your chin up. Keep obeying God. Keep trusting God. And let's allow God to do something that truly is miraculous. Amen? And I'm going to challenge you as you go. There's three people in this story. There's Moses and he led. And maybe you are being called by God to lead. Maybe God's saying to you, it's time to step out and to do what I called you to do. Stop giving excuses and do what God's called you to do. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Maybe you need to lead a group. Maybe you need to gather some people that are screaming, God, and say, hey, God's about to show up and walk through this study with them. Maybe you need to lead your family through this study to teach your children these stories. Or maybe like the Israelites, you just need to follow for now. You need to stop complaining and you need to take a step of faith into the walls of water. But where you don't want to be in this story is you don't want to be in the Egyptian army opposing the work of God. It matters who you follow. And if you find yourself in that camp, there's only two things you can do. Switch teams. Jesus will welcome you. Or get ready to drown. Do not fear man who could destroy your body. Fear God who could destroy your body and and cast your soul into hell. It matters who you follow. So let's follow Christ. Over the next 10 weeks, let's follow the Lord. And let's see what God does as we invite our friends and we invite our neighbors to be a part of this Red Sea Rule experience. And buckle your seat because I don't know what's going to happen to you. But I'm in my Red Sea experience right now.
pray for me. Wednesday, I go in for a heart exam. They're going to go in and see if there's a hole in my heart between my upper atrium things, and that's more than I know. So, um, if so, that would explain a lot. But if not, yes, I'm going to eat better and exercise, doctor. I see you looking at me. <laughs> I'm accountable to all of you. I do need to eat right and exercise. I love you too. I want to close this with a word of prayer, but let me remind you, there are no kangaroos in Denmark, they're in Australia, and in case you're wondering, God has stacked the deck in your life, both the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he has something for you to do. Are you brave enough to get over yourself and to do what God's called you to do? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have called us and that you have gifted us and that you've told us, as Paul said to Timothy, to stir up that gift. It's not easy. You've got to work at it. And God, I thank you for Rick. I thank you for his humility, for his leadership, for the example that he sets. I thank you for his ongoing mentorship. I pray that you would use him to teach me how to preach the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for this church. May we be an army of God and not an audience of slaves. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.